Welcome to another lecture by Medico Medics. Hepatitis Type A. In this lecture, we will present Hepatitis Type A, discuss its normal physiology, patho, compare the two, discuss symptoms, diagnoses, differential diagnoses, and treatment, ending with a case example and a summary. And for our med students, we recommend stopping and reviewing our high yield review. Now, hepatitis A is an acute, self-limiting viral infection of the liver caused by the hepatitis A virus, and it's transmitted primarily via the fecal-oral route. Some key features include that it's acute only, so it does not cause chronic infection. Furthermore, it is highly contagious. It spreads through contaminated food, water, or close contact with an infected individual. And its epidemiology, it is most common in areas with poor sanitation. Children often have mild or asymptomatic infections, while adults may develop more severe symptoms. So important is that it's acute only and does not cause chronic infection. So let's start with normal liver function. So key roles include producing bile to aid in digestion, detoxifying harmful substances like alcohol and drugs, synthesizing proteins like albumin and clotting factors. Now what happens in response to hepatitis A infection? So the virus causes inflammation, and this disrupts bile flow, leading to jaundice and impairing liver function temporarily. Now, bile is a digestive fluid produced by the liver that helps break down fats and eliminate waste products like bilirubin. Ergo, why we say that one of the key roles is producing bile to aid in digestion. Now, in hepatitis, inflammation damages liver cells and impairs bile flow. This leads to a buildup of bilirubin in the blood, and this causes jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin and eyes. Furthermore, we have dark urine and pale stools. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of hepatitis A. So it all begins with the virus entering. So the virus enters the body through the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract and infects hepatocytes, meaning our liver cells, and triggers an immune response. So direct cytopathic effect and immune-mediated injury eventually then lead to hepatocyte apoptosis, meaning cell death. So after viral entry, we have hepatocyte damage. Now, infected hepatocytes release HIV antigens activating our immune cells, our T cells, which then clear the virus, but they also contribute to inflammation. Eventually, that leads to a resolution, so the immune system clears the virus and liver function normalizes within weeks to months. Now, symptomatology. So, it can be asymptomatic in many particularly common in children. However, if we have symptomatic presentation, usually it's two to six weeks after exposure. The early symptoms, the prodromal phase, include fatigue, nausea, vomiting, fever, and a loss of appetite. The icteric phase, we will see jaundice, so yellowing of skin and eyes, dark urine, pale stools, and itching. Systemic symptoms include abdominal pain, especially in the upper right quadrant, and diarrhea. Duration symptoms last typically one to two weeks, up to a few months. Now let's correlate between pathophysiology and symptoms or lab results. So if we have hepatocyte damage, we expect elevated ALT and AST. We also expect jaundice and dark urine. 
Now, ALT and AST are enzymes found in the liver and in other tissues. They are commonly measured in blood tests to assess liver health. So, ALT stands for alanine amino transferase. And ALT is primarily found in the liver. So it's a more specific indicator of limb, liver damage or liver disease. Now, AST stands for aspartate amino transferase, is found in the liver, but also in the heart, our muscles, and other tissues. So if we have elevated AST levels, it could indicate liver issues, of course, or it could indicate damage to other organs. Now, both of these are released into the bloodstream when liver cells are damaged. So high levels can be seen in, for example, hepatitis or a fatty liver or alcohol-related liver disease or other causes of liver injury. Now, some other patho. So if we have inflammation and bile flow impairment, we will expect symptoms of abdominal pain pale stools, and itching. During immune clearance of the virus, we expect fatigue, fever, and gradual symptom resolution. Now, how do we go about diagnosing hepatitis type A? First, we do a clinical diagnosis where we expect or look for jaundice, fatigue, abdominal pain, and recent travel to endemic areas or exposure history. When we check for abdominal pain, we are expecting it in the right upper quadrant. Why? Because this is where your liver is situated. Of course, you have to think of this picture in the anatomical position. So your left is the patient's right. Now, based on the previous slide, it should be quite clear what kind of lab tests we are looking for. But let's delve into details. So we do liver enzyme tests, and we are looking for elevated ALT and AST. These will indicate hepatocellular injury. Now, another value we look for is bilirubin. So we look for elevated bilirubin during the jaundice phase. Now, why do we look for bilirubin? Well, bilirubin levels are elevated primarily due to liver cell damage caused by this viral infection. Because as we mentioned before in the pathophysiology, the hepatitis A virus causes inflammation and damage to liver cells, right? And it impairs their ability to process bilirubin. As we mentioned in normal liver function, one of the main functions is indeed to process bilirubin. Now, normally the liver conjugates bilirubin. It means that it makes it water soluble and then it can be excreted into bile. However, when the liver is damaged, this process is disrupted, leading to an accumulation of bilirubin in the blood. And it is this elevated level of bilirubin that gives us the presentation of jaundice, meaning yellow, yellowing of skin and eyes. Now, what about blood tests? Looking for the immunoglobulin M, anti-hepatitis type A virus, it will confirm an acute infection. Another immunoglobulin is type G, anti-hepatitis A virus. This will indicate a past infection or immunity, so either vaccine or previous exposure. And of course, we do an exclusion of other causes like Hep B, Hep C, or other liver diseases. Now let's give hepatitis type A some clinical context and do some differential diagnoses. If we compare it to hep B, hepatitis type B can cause chronic infection. Do you remember that hep A only caused acute infection? Furthermore, hep B will be confirmed by hepatitis B surface antigens and hep B virus DNA. Same similarly with hep C often asymptomatic initially, and it is confirmed by anti-hepatitis C virus RNA. 
With Hep E, they have a similar fecal oral route, but Hep E is more severe in pregnant women and of course requires anti-hepatitis type E virus testing. Some other pathologies that we differentiate with is drug-induced liver injury. So this person might have a history of hepatotoxic drug use um, or alcoholic hepatitis associated with heavy alcohol use. But here we might see a difference in our enzyme values where AST should be more elevated than ALT, usually in 2 to 1 ratio. And we have autoimmune hepatitis, which is a chronic course with positive ANA or anti-smooth muscle antibodies. Now let's go back to treatment and management of Hep A. So it has no specific antiviral therapy. Supportive care is the mainstay. First of all, hydration for nausea and vomiting, rest and avoidance of hepatotoxic substances like alcohol or certain drugs. Of course, we monitor for complications. Rare cases of fulminant hepatitis may require hospitalization and intensive care. Prognosis, usually excellent, with full recovery and a lifelong immunity. Now let's look at a case example of hepatitis type A. A 24-year-old male presents with fatigue, nausea, and abdominal discomfort for three days. He notices his urine has turned dark yellow and his eyes appear yellowish. He returned from a trip to Southeast Asia two weeks ago where he consumed street food and drinks. In our clinical examination, we find mild jaundice right upper quadrant tenderness and our labs show elevated ALT and AST. We further test him and his serology reports anti-hepatitis type A virus immunoglobulin M antibodies. So management, supportive care with rest, hydration and low-fat diet is advised on proper hygiene to prevent household transmission and further education on vaccination for future travels. Now, what can we do to prevent Hep A? First of all, vaccination. So, Hepatitis A vaccine. This is recommended for travelers to endemic regions, food workers, and high-risk populations. Two doses typically provide long-term protection. Another way to prevent is hygiene, so hand washing, especially after using the bathroom or before preparing food. And just a Key point here, these two should never be simultaneous. Now, safe food practices. So avoid contaminated water, raw shellfish, or undercooked food in these areas. We also have post-exposure prophylaxis. So take vaccine or immunoglobulins within two weeks of exposure. Now, what are some potential complications of Hep A? Rare complications include fulminant hepatitis, which is a severe acute liver failure, and this is more common in older adults or those with pre-existing liver disease. Cholestatic hepatitis, so prolonged jaundice and puritis lasting weeks to months. However, no chronic disease, because unlike hepatitis B and C, hepatitis A does not progress to chronic infection or to cirrhosis. So in summary then, the pathogen, hepatitis A virus, is an RNA virus. Mode of transmission is fecal-oral route, like contaminated food or water. Clinical features, acute hepatitis with jaundice, fatigue, abdominal pain, but no chronic phase. Diagnoses, anti-hepatitis A virus, immunoglobulin M, so acute infection. Treatment, supportive care, and it's self-limiting. Prevention, vaccination, proper hygiene, and sanitation. Here is our high-yield review for Hep A. If you're a med student, stop the video and repeat these. That's the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening. If you liked our video, please like and subscribe for more videos.